This evening, as you know, we're beginning a, uh, well, actually continuing a study on the Ten Commandments. We began looking at how the Lord calls us to a life of total consecration. We saw that God has given us a standard, how we might live for His glory. And that standard, as you know, is summarized in the Ten Commandments. So that's uh, what we're looking at this evening, beginning with the First Commandment. And that's really, uh, I think, pretty much what I would like to read for you, although it wouldn't be... Um, a problem to read from beginning in verse 1. Just wanted to see what we had going on up here. Okay, so Exodus chapter 20. Let me read for you verses 1 through 3. Then God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. May the Lord bless his word to our hearing uh, this evening. Now, again, let me just remind you of what we've already seen that, that God does in his word. Uh, he, he lays a claim on, on us in, entirely. Uh, we can no longer claim any part of our lives as belonging to ourselves if we have trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord puts his claim on our entire lives. He wants us to give ourselves completely to him. As a matter of fact, as, as I read these words from the Ten Commandments, you're probably aware that the Lord reminds his people before he gives the standard of how he would have them to live, he reminds them of what it is he has done for them. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. That is why you should be ingratiated to me. That's why you should love me. That's why you should do what I'm calling you to do. Now, we realize that we haven't been called out of Egypt, at least in the literal sense, we have been called out of the world by the gospel. We have been called out of the house of slavery, out of the house of Satan, basically. We were in bondage to him. But now we have been set free to serve the Lord, and this is how the Lord would have us to serve him. These ten words, these ten commandments. And we saw last week that, as opposed to many broad evangelical churches, we do not believe that God has set the commandments aside in the new covenant this is not plan B, as dispensationalism seems to believe. This is fulfillment. And because it's fulfillment, the standard is basically the same. Our Lord Jesus Christ came into the world to fulfill the commandments, and he didn't fulfill them to do away with them, as we saw, but rather he fulfilled them in order that he might write them on our hearts, that he might give us the desire to keep them and to serve them and to reflect the image of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we might say that the new covenant is not an absence of the standard of righteousness, but rather it is the power to keep that standard through a changed heart. Now, since this is true, the commandments really serve two purposes for us. Uh, they teach us how we are to live, how we are to devote ourselves to the Lord, what it is he means when he says, uh, pick up your cross and follow after me. What it means when he says you must die to yourself, that you are no longer to live your life, but rather Christ is to live in you. But it also shows us whether or not we are saved by the evidence of the Spirit of God having written that law upon our hearts. Now, we're going to uh, focus mainly on the first purpose to see what it is these commandments actually call us to do. But I just want to make a note regarding the second, that this is always going to be there, and we should always be examining our hearts according to these commandments as to whether or not we actually love these things and whether we're intending on doing them because of the main difference between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant is that the Spirit of God has written these laws upon our hearts, then we can know that we are a part of the New Covenant when we see the evidence that that law, in fact, has been written on our hearts. When we, like the Lord Jesus Christ, can delight in the law of God and actually keep it from the heart. Again, we want to make sure that we distinguish what we're talking about here from what's called legalism, the idea that, that we save ourselves by keeping the law that we earn our own righteousness and our own standing before God uh, by our own obedience. We do not do that. We cannot do that. Those who are the works of the law are under the curse. 
If you try to save yourself by law keeping, you will continue in your condemned state. We keep the commandments because the Spirit of God has written them on our hearts and it is our nature to do that. We love the commandments enough to actually do these things. And so as we go through what these different commandments are teaching us, examine your heart and see whether or not the desire to do these things is actually there. If it is, then you're saved. But if it isn't, then you still need the saving work of the Spirit of God in your heart to trust the Lord Jesus Christ and that you might willingly bow the knee to Him in keeping His commandments. Now this evening we're going to look at the first commandment which I believe is the foundation of everything that follows. If you do not keep this one, if you don't have the desire to keep this one, you're certainly not going to want to keep the rest of the commandments. The Lord says to you this evening, you shall have no other gods before me. Or which is the same thing as our Lord Jesus Christ said to Satan when he was being tempted in the wilderness. You shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Now tonight I want us to consider three things. First of all, that to keep this commandment, you must believe that the Lord is. Secondly, you must devote yourself to him entirely. That's what it's calling you to do. And then thirdly, I want us to just take a look at, at how that works itself out in our lives, what that should look like, what we should be experiencing. Well, first of all, to have no other gods before the true God, you have to believe that the true God exists. Without that, you can't devote your life to him. Without that, you can't please him. The author to the Hebrews tells us in Hebrews 11:6. And without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. If you're going to take the true God as your God, you have to believe that he exists. Now, the sad thing is, God, well, it's not sad in this respect. God has not left himself without a witness, right? Not just the witness of his word, not just the witness of his people, but a universal witness that is everywhere for everyone to see at all times. And that certainly is natural revelation. And part of that natural revelation, I believe, as you understand, is the conscience the Lord has given to us, that everyone everywhere understands something of God's standard and they know something of the fact they've broken those standards. The sad thing that I want to mention was this, that, that the evidence that exists that is all around us, which is so overwhelming, yet so often is, is hidden by the sinfulness of our hearts. I mean, we find that even as Christians. The evidence, really, there's no question that God exists, but don't you find yourself even sometimes wondering or looking for the evidence or trying to convince yourself that these things are actually true, whether he really exists or not? Now, why is it that that happens? Well, it's obviously not because of a lack of evidence. There's plenty of evidence. If we had time, we could look at some of that. But it's not the problem with the evidence, the problem is with us. The problem is sin. The problem is our flesh. Your flesh doesn't want you to see God. Your flesh doesn't want you to admit that He is. Now remember what the flesh is. It's basically sin in your hearts. If you're a Christian, it's still in there. It's that remaining corruption that we all have to deal with that is constantly fighting against us and keeping us from doing what we otherwise would like to do for God's glory. And you know that sin at its very root and its very essence is hatred against God. It instinctively knows that if you seek the Lord in the way the Lord would have you to do, if you see the Lord as he would have you to see him, that it is going to suffer, that it is going to be destroyed might say that the old man, that flesh, that sinful nature in us, has a life of its own. If it had its own way, it would hide God completely from you and blind you to his existence. If it had its way, it would destroy you. And that's exactly what it's trying to do. But if you were to worship the Lord, you have to believe that he is. You have to see through that. And if you are to believe with the kind of certainty that you need, to honor the Lord and to fulfill this commandment, 
you need to fight against that corruption. You need to fight against that flesh, against the old man. You need to put it to death. And you must be filled with the Spirit of God. Now just think about your own experience, and I hope you've experienced this sometime in your life. If you haven't, it's something you certainly can experience. But when you are walking with the Lord and you are filled with the Spirit of God, the evidence that God has given to you, even natural revelation, becomes so powerful. It, it just almost presses in on you and speaks everywhere of God's existence. Even just looking at a wall or at a floor or anything that exists, all you can think of is God is. All of this evidence in the creation and His Word in your own heart becomes so powerful so overwhelming that, that it dispels every doubt that God exists. Now the problem that we have is living in a sinful world. The compromises that we make as we're tempted by the things in the world, the compromises we make with God's holy standards, the love of the world weakens the Spirit's work in our hearts. And as that work is weakened, our conviction that God exists also is weakened. The only answer to this, the only way that we're going to be able to see God as we ought to see Him is to repent of every single sin that we're aware of, to surrender to Him, to submit to all His commandments, to use the means of grace diligently. And if you do that, as I said before, everywhere you look, you will see God. So if you are to honor the Lord in this commandment and to have no other God before him, the first thing you need to do, of course, is you need to be fully convinced in your heart that God exists. And this is something that even Christians can struggle with because of the corruption that is in us. You need to, to weaken it, to, to set on it, to kill it, to put it, if you could, out of its misery. Sadly, we can't in this life. But if you could, you would kill it and be filled with the Spirit of God, and then you will have that kind of conviction. Well, secondly, you need to devote your life to Him, because you know that knowing that God exists is not enough. Even studying about God and learning everything there is to learn about Him is not enough. You must take God personally to be your God. He must be the one that your life is committed to. And I don't mean by that just this God out of all the other gods. Of course, there are no other gods, but the true God out of, uh, you know, among all the other false gods that exist or all the false gods that exist. But you need to devote your life to him solely among all the things that exist. Now, everyone in this world has something that they're devoted to. The Lord has made us creatures of purpose. We need to have purpose. We need to have something that motivates us. We need a reason to live. Those who lack motivation are those who end up doing nothing. That's basically what the sluggard is like. Those who lose purpose altogether, you know what happens to them. They either die because they just don't want to live or they commit suicide. They can't live without a reason. They have to have a reason. How many people have you heard of? How many people that you know uh, ended their lives because they lost their reason for living? They lost that person or that thing, maybe that one that they loved most of all, and they no longer wanted to live because their reason for living was gone. I mean, you know how it is with uh, perhaps some married couples, if, you know, the husband dies and it's not very long after the wife dies or vice versa because they had within themselves their reason for living. They lived for each other. That was their purpose. For other people, it might be some object, maybe wealth or fame or fortune, whatever it may be, and if that thing is taken away from them, their reason for living also ends. I mean, how many superstars, as you, in, you know, the, the world has, how many have committed suicide? because they've lost that which they live for. It's taken out of their hands. Well, the point is, for you as a Christian, that thing that you live for, that purpose, needs to be God. It can't be anything else. It can't be a husband or wife. It can't be your children. 
It can't be your house. It can't be your car, your job, your position, your reputation, your bank account. It can't be personal fame and glory. It must be God. You must devote your life to Him, to love Him and to serve Him. Because the Bible says that anything we actually place in front of God, anything that takes that place of, of that reason for our living, that thing we devote our lives to, if it's not God, then what that thing is that you have devoted your life to is an idol. And that idol has to go. And so that calls all of us to ask this question this evening, what are you living for? What is it that moves you? What is it that motivates you, that drives you to do what it is you do? Where do you spend most of your time? What are you really seeking after in the things that you do? Well, if the answer isn't God and the glory of God, it's not love for Him. That's not what's driving you. If He's not the one that your life is basically devoted to, then you are guilty of idolatry. And whatever those idols are, whatever those things are that you love more than God, that you've devoted your life to, has to go. God has to be first. The Lord says, you shall have no other gods before me. You need to turn from that idolatry. Trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and follow him. By the way, I do want to remind you that whatever God calls you to do is for your good. It is good. God is the greatest good. And to have him as the center of your life and the center of your heart is the only thing that is good for you. And everything else that you do, and, and God's not telling you don't love your wife, don't love your children, uh, don't have possessions and things like that, but whatever you have, you have to have and use for his glory, do for his glory. He needs to be central in all those relationships, in all those things you do. God must be first. You shall have no other gods before me. So you must not only believe that God is, but you must devote yourself, your whole life to him. He has to be your reason for living. Now finally, how is this to work itself out in your life? Well, as we saw in our meditation, obviously you need to love God most of all and put him first in your life. That's what we need to see. That's what we need to understand how to do. I think it begins by, of course, affection. You have to have affection for him. He's not asking you to act out the part. He's not saying be a hypocrite. I mean, the Lord knows whether you love him or not. You really need to feel affection in your heart for the Lord. You really need to love him. You need to be able to say honestly with the psalmist in perhaps one of those most convicting passages in the psalm, Psalm 73, verses 25 and 26. Whom have I in heaven but you? And besides you, I desire nothing on earth. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Basically, how this works itself out in your life, first of all, is that God is the one you love most of all. You love him so much that nothing else even comes close. Nothing in heaven. Even loved ones who have gone before you into heaven, you love them, but nowhere near as much as you love the Lord. And even those things upon the earth, remember what Jesus said to those who were following him. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. So how does this work itself out in your life? Well, first of all, God must be first in your heart with everything else being a distant second, so much so as Jesus says you even hate by comparison those who are closest to you. And you do understand God is not saying hate your father and mother, hate your sisters and brothers. But he's saying, in comparison to your love for me, that is how you will view them. Now, of course, if you love the Lord in this way, you will also seek the Lord as you ought. Seek him. Seek to know him. Seek to know who he is. Seek to know what he's all about. Seek to know what pleases him. 
Even as David writes in Psalm 63, verse 1, O God, you are my God. I shall seek you earnestly. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh yearns for you in a dry and weary land where there is no water. Your desire for the Lord will be so great that you'll feel it as you feel when you're hungry and you're thirsty. You have this, this desire and yearning for food and water. That's the way your soul will yearn after the Lord. And so you will want to know him. You'll want to know everything that can be known about him, everything the Lord has revealed about himself. And when you see those things and you learn those things, you will embrace those things. As a matter of fact, you know God has given you his word to reveal himself to you. And so you will pick up the Bible and you will read the Bible, not just to say, uh, okay, I've checked off that psalm, I've read you know, all the psalms I'm supposed to read to for this particular month and reading the Bible together, or I've gone through McShane's Bible reading program and I've checked off my four chapters for the day, but rather you will prayerfully read the Bible and learn about God from it. You will let the Bible correct you when you find that there are things you believed about God that actually weren't true. And when you do learn something about him that is true, you'll hold on to it and you'll think about it. And you'll meditate on him throughout the day, at least as much as you're able to, as far as your schedule will allow. And then you will try to reflect that same thing about God, at least if it's something you're capable of reflecting, those you know, communicable attributes of God. You'll try to be the same way. You'll, you'll you know, develop a character by God's grace that is like his. Uh, Peter does remind us that through the gospel we have become partakers of the divine nature. And he doesn't mean that we're, you know, become God in essence, but we share the same moral nature. And those things that we see about God, we will want reflected in our own lives. When somebody says something about God that isn't true, you will be jealous for his honor because you love him. And you'll be concerned enough to do what you can to try to correct that misunderstanding so that God will be honored. And of course, you'll do it in a way that's pleasing to the Lord. You won't jump on the person's back or jump down their throat, I guess is the uh, expression is. But rather you will in gentleness try to correct them by the Spirit of God. Now more than anything else, you will certainly, if you love the Lord, you will want to, do, to please Him. You'll want to know what pleases Him. You'll want to know how the Lord desires to be worshipped so that you might worship him in that way. You'll want to know how to honor his name through, you know, using his name reverently, which has to do with, with vows and oaths and promises we make. You'll want to know how to honor his name by keeping your promises so that you can be careful to keep them. You'll want to know how to keep his Sabbaths holy so that you can keep it holy to him. And as you know from the rest of the commandments, you'll want to know how it is you should seek to love your brothers and sisters, your brothers and sisters in Christ, even your neighbors who are outside of Christ who live all around you so that you can love them in that way. So again, you'll pick up the Bible and you'll read what it has to say. You'll attend worship and listen to the exposition of God's word and the sermons and you will let the Spirit of God show you and teach you what it is that you need to do. And when you become convinced that this or that is God's will, that this is something He wants, you will embrace it and you will apply it to your life. You will seek to do the very best you possibly can. You know, sadly, today there seems to be a premium on knowledge, doesn't there? We all want to know what the Bible says. We all want to know what God is like. We all want to know what, uh, well, at least many Christians do. We want to know what God wants of us, and we spend our lives just seeking to understand those things so that we can tell others about it, so that we can teach classes about it, or whatever. And yet, many times we don't actually take what he says and apply it to our own lives. We need not just to study to, to know these things. We, we need to study to do these things, as John Frame also pointed out in one of his seminary classes, the ability to apply it is really understanding it. 
The more you understand how to apply it, the better you understand it. Certainly, that is true. And so as you seek to apply it, you'll learn more. As you learn more, you'll apply it more and so forth. And you will continue to grow into the image of Christ. Now, you also will be suspicious of your own heart into thinking that what you want to do is what God wants you to do rather than the other way around. This is certainly one of the reasons why so many different denominations of churches exist, not the only reason. But we have to admit, there are certain things that the Lord says, certain things he calls us to do that sometimes we find that we really don't want to do. Sometimes churches convince themselves that that is in fact what the Bible says, so they don't have to do it any longer. We have to be careful that we don't fall into this trap. The point of this commandment is that you must be willing to pay whatever the Lord requires. And certainly you will be if you have the Spirit of God living in you. I'm not saying it wouldn't be a struggle. It's a struggle. We have to fight against our flesh. But you realize that you cannot do things your own way, that you don't come to the Bible and tell the Bible what you want it to say, but you come to the Bible and you listen to what God has to say to you, and then you do it. Again, because you love Him, because the Spirit of God has given you the desire to do that, because you know that's what He commands you to do, because you know what He commands you to do is good and right, that His ways are always the best. Now, his ways aren't always the safest in this world, and that's one of the struggles that we have, at least humanly speaking. But they are the safest in the light of eternity, certainly. Don't forget that you have to walk on this path if you're going to enter into heaven. That's another good reason to do it, but we, we don't have the option. We, again, we don't tell God what, what uh, we should do or what we're going to do. He tells us. And the fact that we're walking on that path, again, is the evidence we are his children. Again, listen to what Jesus says, and then you ask yourself the question, do I have the right to tell God what I'm going to do? Or does he have the right to tell me? Jesus says this in Matthew 16. If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake We'll find it. And then Matthew 7, verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Does it sound to you that the commandments are optional? Does it sound to you like you can tell God what you're, what you're going to do and what you're not going to do? No, the Lord must be God. You can't be God. He has to be God. You shall have no other gods before me, not even the idol of self. You have to obey him. So if God is to be your God, you must follow him. If you are to enter heaven, you must do the Father's will. You must know the Lord, seek to know the Lord, seek to know his will and do his will. So first of all, judge your heart by this commandment. Do you believe that God exists? I hope you do. This is probably one of the reasons why you're here this evening. Have you taken this God to be your God? I think most of us here probably have at least, you know, believe that we have. Have you devoted your life to him? Is he your reason for living? Is he your purpose in life? Is he what moves you to do what you do? Do you love him? And do you show that love by trying to learn more about him? Again, loving God is not just learning you know, what he's like and being able to list out all of his attributes. Knowing God certainly is, is also something that is personal. It's a, a relationship. But it doesn't exclude knowing what he is like. We do need to know what he's like. And knowing what he's like, we need to embrace him and love him. Do you love what you learn about him? And are you trying to make him known to others? And what about what he wants you to do? Are you trying to learn what pleases the Lord? And are you seeking to do what it is that is honoring to him? Are you watching over your heart so that you don't fall into the trap of doing what you want to do 
thinking that you're doing God's will, are you allowing yourself to do only those things that you know are consistent with God and with His revealed will? You know, what God calls you to do is perfectly consistent with who God is. And if you can't reconcile what you're doing with those things, then what you're doing is not God's will. Now, if these things are true of you, then that's fairly compelling evidence that God has written his law on your heart, that you're saved. Now, again, remember that none of these things are going to be in your life perfectly. Every one of us is going to fail in a variety of ways to know him and to obey him as we should. But we do need to realize that if there is any love in our hearts for the Lord at all so that we desire these things, that that can only be there because the Spirit of God is present in your heart. That you have savingly believed. Now, what should you do if that is the case with you? Well, don't be content with your current level of love, but nurture that love and guard that love. Don't do the things that you know are going to uh, quench that love and cause it to, to be weakened, but rather do the things that strengthen it. Uh, consecrate your life to him. Now, again, we're talking about how can we live a life totally consecrated to God? Well, we have to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. We have to turn from our sins. God's given us a standard. We need to keep that standard, right? Well, this is how we live a life consecrated to God. This is the standard. But how are we going to find the power to live according to that standard? Well, again, it has a lot to do with the way we live. We've got to stop making those compromises. Stop telling God what we're going to do and what, not, what we're not going to do. Submit to him. Obey him. Use the means of grace. Seek to know him. Seek to know his will and apply those things. And that is how you live a life totally consecrated to God that, that is increasing, that is growing into the likeness of Jesus Christ. Again, we're not going to reach total consecration, but that should be our goal, is to do it to the very best of our ability with God's help. We couldn't do it at all without his help. But again, we have something to do with that. We have to work with God's grace in our hearts. We have to commit ourselves to do this. And as we do, we will grow in that consecration to him. But now if in examining yourselves, you haven't found that, that love for God, you haven't found that desire to do his will, and you found that you really are telling God what you're going to do and, and what you're not going to do instead of just simply submitting to him, that you have idols in your life. Well, what are you going to do? Or what should you do? Well, the Lord tells you, repent. Tear those idols down. Just like they did in Israel every time they repented. First thing they did was they went for the idols to tear them down. You need to tear the idols down in your life. That's what repentance is all about. Turn away from those idols. Come to the Lord Jesus Christ. Trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Ask him for the grace to live for his glory that he might put his love in your heart. Trust in him. Turn from your sins. And then, as our Lord Jesus says, take his yoke upon you and learn of him. Follow him. Pick up your cross. Follow after him. It's the only way to heaven. It's the only safe way. And it's the only thing you can do if you are to keep this commandment. You shall have no other gods for me. Well, may the Lord um, apply his word to our hearts this evening as each of us needs to hear it. Let's bow in just a moment of prayer and ask for the Lord's grace to do that.